Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is episode two of the Lives of Adventure podcast, and I'm your host, Jeff Gardner. In this podcast, we aim to bring you the stories of people that live lives that are a little less common. People who have made the choice to abandon the default path and seek something more. We'll be talking to those who push the limits of human capability, but we'll also be talking to entrepreneurs, musicians, artists, and more. Because to me, adventure is about a lot more than just risking your life. To set yourself up for an adventure, really all you need to do is just actively put yourself into a position where the outcome is uncertain. And if you're today's guest, Joan Malloy, adventure is also about putting yourself into a position that you think might stretch you to the brink of what you're currently capable of. Joan is a lifelong sailor, a one-time climber, a sometimes engineer, and is currently the fleet captain at the Offshore Academy in Cowes on the Isle of Wight. She's also currently preparing herself and searching for sponsors to kick off her own solo sailing campaign this year, hopefully culminating with the next Vondi Globe in 2020. We talk about everything from her earliest memories of sailing, her short-lived engineering career, how she made the jump to being a full-time professional sailor, and the attractions of being alone on a boat in the middle of an ocean. So, without any further ado, please enjoy this conversation with my friend, Joan Malloy. So, Joan, tell me about your first memory of sailing. I find it hard to actually pinpoint one memory because I probably, I actually went on a boat before I could remember anything. Um, as I grew up in the West of Ireland and my dad was a muscle farmer and my grandparents and aunties were into sailing. Um, probably one of my first memories, vivid memories of being on a sailing boat is being on a sailing boat with my family, like my grandparents and my auntie and some cousins. And it was raining and it was pretty windy. Well, it felt pretty windy. I'd say I nowadays I wouldn't say it was very windy. But um, somebody had been seasick on the side of the boat. And the last thing they'd had before was a blackberry yogurt. And I just remember this image of the blackberry yogurt going like up and down the side of the boat with each wave. <laughs> so that's probably one of my earliest, most vivid memories of sailing. That is uh, epic. That is like a really, really good first memory. <laughs> <laughs> windy had, raining west of ireland the whole family's there and someone's vomited blackberry yogurt across the side of the boat <laughs> yeah yeah Brilliant. it was it was um it was classy but yeah it doesn't get more it doesn't get much more irish than that though does it? <laughs> no no and we're all having a great time yeah yeah but my um my granny didn't really like sailing because it was too drafty also very irish <laughs> yeah <laughs> that oh, that's was, amazing that was but then I remember, I definitely remember the first day of being on a sailing course when I was taught sailing and being pretty apprehensive about the whole thing. And, you know, the instructor, I was about seven or eight. And Were you guys in like little small dinghies or was it? Yeah, like- little small dinghies, little small two person dinghies. But we were so small, there was four of us in it. Um, and we were sent out, like just launched off the slipway and we had to do a capsize drill where they capsize the boat over. And I remember thinking, well, I'm not up for this. Yeah. But actually, don't me in the sea. What? Yeah. <laughs> Once we did capsize and we all got back in the boat, I was like, that was awesome. Yeah. Do, that again. <laughs> do you remember what kind of boat it was? It was a mirror dinghy. Okay. I was going to yeah, say, it was, was it an opti? Cause I think no. like, Optimus is like the classic, you know, teaching boat for little kids in my mind. And it's just, it's yeah, a bathtub it basically. Yeah, it is. We were, I guess, our the sailing club I learned to sail in in at home in Westport is was pretty small, so we didn't really have a very big variety of boats. We just kind of had whatever people had kicking around in their sheds, basically. So, right, um, oppies were definitely um, like a posh boat. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and one Interesting. one turned up, it like was an actual bathtub and sank, and nobody wanted to sail it. Right, right. They're funny boats. Um, yeah. Yeah, sure. There. <laughs> cool. So, you know, I guess 
in that same vein, you know, is sailing connected with muscle farming in any way, you know, like what your, what your dad did, or is that, you know, are they just separate things and you just lived on the water and, and water was sort of a part of everything when you grew up? It's an interesting one that, because sailing isn't directly related to muscle farming, I don't think. And certainly when we were younger, you know, my parents didn't sail, although my, my dad could sail and my aunt and my cousins were definitely a big part of me learning how to sail. You know, I went to sailing with my cousins and my aunt then would later on, years later when I learned to sail, my aunt would bring me out sailing on the boats she sailed on. Um, so I suppose they were quite a big influence in it. But I think actually as I've got older, I've realized how the influence of my dad's work and just being at sea and I suppose realizing how important the sea was to him and my grandparents and my whole family really um that's made me realize maybe that is part of who I am um but ironically my mother is not into the sea at all not one bit she the only thing she likes doing in the sea is swimming in warm seawater <laughs> So um, it's it's interesting, but I like to think I've got other attributes that she gave me that are still useful to use when sailing. <laughs> Swimming in warm <laughs> seawater. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> A nose for warm seas. Yeah. 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 Very exactly. cool. So I guess let's fast forward a little bit uh, because... I met you in a very different context uh, from sailing, which is climbing. And I actually didn't know you were into sailing at all for quite a while when, when I first met you. Um, how did you get into climbing and, and kind of was that an interlude or was the sailing always always there and, and climbing sort of was an interloper for a little while? It's, it's interesting because sailing was always something that I had um, you know, when I, from when I was like eight to 19, that's what I did every summer. I would go, go and do sailing for a month and then, you know, I'd do some races. So for about three or four months, yeah, I would, I would do a lot of sailing. But then as I started climbing when I was about 12, so that came in as well. And, you know, when you're a teenager, it's quite easy to kind of have two things on the go. You've kind of got, you could do something in the summer and something else the weekends. But then I guess as I got older, the climbing, you know, at one stage I made some life choices like to move inland where the climbing was really good. And one thing I definitely realized that I missed sailing a lot. So when I when I moved back to a coastal town, I really kind of put climbing on the back burner and sailed really hard for a few years. And so it's it's a funny one because I remember somebody asking me in Sheffield, we were talking about being professional sports people. And um, I remember somebody saying like, oh, I could, I could climb every day. I remember thinking like, I could, I love climbing, but I couldn't climb every day, but I could sail every day. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was funny because I, at the time it was just like a quick chat in a coffee shop, but actually, <laughs> actually, <laughs> looking, looking back at it now. <laughs> yeah. You're like, well, that's what I do now. Yeah, or I try to do anyway. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, and so, you know, was there? I suppose where does engineering factor into this? Because you went to university and got an engineering degree, and then subsequently, you know, worked as an engineer for a couple of years. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, I did, and I suppose it's that was kind of a it's quite a traditional path to take. You know, you go to school and then you go to university and then you go off and work and it's funny because I it sounds a bit silly but I'd never realized that you could actually I could actually do a sport professionally and it took me quite a long time like it took me till I was in my mid-20s to be like oh you can actually earn a living by just sailing wow <laughs> was there um, was there some like uh some event that triggered that realization or was it just, you know, over time it slowly dawned on you? Yeah, well I did, um, probably like a, one of the biggest like changes 
or like shifts in in my life that ever happened was I got invited to do this round Ireland race on um on a Volvo 70 which is a a fast race yacht and um a really fast race yacht they were designed to race around the world in the Volvo Ocean Race and so I got invited to do the round Ireland race which is a lot smaller but <laughs> still exciting if you're Irish um on that boat and I kind of saw it as a cool, let's have a month off real life and do some training on this boat and like sail around really fast everywhere and it's going to be really cool. And it was, and I did all that. But then once the race finished, instead of packing up and going home, the skipper offered me a job on the boat. And that's when I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, you can get paid <laughs> can to do this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, obviously, I always knew that there was professional sailors existed, you know, there's professionals in nearly every sport, but just the, I can do this. I can make a living doing this, you know. Yeah. So was, that was, was, that, that was, uh, was that a scary thought on some level? Yeah, for sure. It was. Yeah. But I, I don't know. At the time, it, I didn't really feel scared. I was a little bit worried that I was making the wrong decision, but I wasn't scared to make it, if you get me, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah. Did I, it feel, I, I mean, did it feel like yeah. it was a reversible decision in a sense, or was it? did you feel like you were really jumping off a cliff and, you know? Well, for some aspects, like, for I had to kind of basically completely abandon my life in Ireland, which meant leaving some, someone and leaving the life I had thought that was pretty, you know, I pretty much had it all figured out I thought and thought I knew what was going to happen and then it was like somebody had just like pulled a rug out from under me and was like oh no no that's not what's going to happen <laughs> um so it didn't feel that reversible but I was still gonna make it I still made it was it an obvious choice then because I mean it, like you said you had to leave someone you left basically everything you had worked to set up to that point like was it just something that felt so I, I've got to do this that you know you, you the decision was made before it was even thought about really or was it more that you had to kind of agonize through all the details and and come to the decision after some period well I, I it's funny because I thought that I was really agonizing over all the details and I wasn't, I'd made the decision, you know, you'd, I realized at the end, you know, that I, I wouldn't be agonizing over all the details if I didn't want to do it. Like if I hadn't already decided to do it, right? because I think if I'd, if my decision was to stay home or to stay, you know, on the life I had, um, I wouldn't have been agonizing for a second. I would have just done that. I would have been like, thank you very much. That's a lovely offer, but no. Right. But instead, the reason I was agonizing for so long was because I'd made this decision that on the surface seemed crazy. Um, but actually, I think it was the right thing for me to do. So I was just kind of agonizing to try and make, to find a couple of things to say, like, it's okay, you're making the right decision. Right. I couldn't find any, but I just did it anyway. <laughs> You knew and that was all that mattered. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and did you get a, a lot of pushback from, you know, family and friends and things on on that choice? Um, not not really, like not to my face anyway. Um I no, everyone was, you know, everyone my family especially were very supportive. Um as I, I guess it wasn't you know, it did in some ways it felt reversible you know, I could always move home and, and work as an engineer again. And yeah, life would be different, but you know, that, that's what happens. But so I didn't, I didn't get much pushback. No, I just felt like I was fairly well supported. Cool. That's great. Um, and then at the time, like, did that, you know, was that choice really for you kind of a setting off point? Like, was it a step into the unknown of kind of, okay, my life could have followed this, uh, like you were saying, quite, um, quite obvious path, quite maybe traditional path, or now I've kind of branched off somewhere that's uh, into the deep dark woods, and I, I don't know where I'm going to find myself in in the future. Yeah, completely. And even though you know that was only th two years ago, 
you know, the path from there to here is, you know, the whole thing has been completely, like you said, deep, dark woods, like branches going off everywhere. No, you know, it's, um, and it's interesting because the more I kind of go down that path, the more I realize, oh, I can do this. Oh, I, I can do this actually, or I can do this. You know, I don't, a couple of times I've like been like, oh, okay, that's enough fun. Time to stop and be an engineer or time to stop and get a proper job. But um, I think I'm gathering a bit more momentum now, <laughs> a bit less like, no, I don't have to do that. I don't need, I don't need a nine to five. I don't need a desk job. I can make it work. Right. That's brilliant. So let's jump back because I think uh, Volvo 70s, uh, I have been interested or or I've just loved watching the Volvo Ocean race for a couple of years. Uh, And I think it's it's a really interesting boat. Um, I had a friend who's uh, really into sailing describe it as glued together just enough so it doesn't totally disintegrate, but it really wants to all the time. Uh, I guess, you know, can you describe just a little bit about, you know, just describe the boat a little bit and tell us some of the kind of neat features on it. Um, well, they are a Volvo open 70, so they're 70 feet long and they were designed for the Volvo ocean race, like you said, and they're designed at the time they were the fastest single hull boats around and they were quite a, I guess it it added to the kind of much macho image of the Volvo Ocean Race. You know, it was a really these really big, powerful boats, loads of spray, loads of drama, really big sails, really high speeds, really high loads on everything. So, for a sailor like they're the, they were the ultimate boat. You know, when the I went and like watched a few um, legs of the Volvo Ocean Race, like the starts and finishes, and you know, as a sailor, even just walking past the boats on the dock, you're like, oh my God, there's a Volvo 70. That's right. so cool. <laughs> they are they are absolutely the Formula One of uh, sailing or, the, you know, they were at the time yeah. that they were originally yeah. produced. Yeah, exactly. And they're beasts. You know, they had a lot of power. They could go really fast. And um, yeah, there's, yeah. So that's, I guess for me, there was a lot of history of sailing a Volvo 70. And then even just, without all the history it was a cool boat yeah, <laughs> you know you just could a really straight up cool boat yeah yeah exactly like really made of completely made of carbon fiber so really light um has a a canting keel which is a keel that that swings from side to side it works by hydraulics and that basically means you can put more power in the sails and continue to drive forward instead of without tipping sides. over <laughs> yeah yeah exactly without yeah. tipping over um so that is one of the features that makes it really cool. The hulls for their size are really light um, and they've got really big sails and yeah, it's an awesome thing to spend a year on. <laughs> yeah. So tell me uh, a little, before we go on with the rest of the, uh, I guess, Volvo story, let's, um, let's quickly talk about uh, single hull versus uh, multi hull or, you know, what a lot of people would just call catamaran um, and, and kind of, like, is there a, you know, in my mind, I'm kind of like, I feel like there's two pretty distinct camps in sailing where you either are a single hull sailor or you kind of gravitate more towards the, the multi hulls. Is that a thing or is, or do people kind of float between the two depending on the situation or depending on the type of race it is? Yeah, I, I think you're, the second statement is more true that especially at the top end, like for, say, for example, the there's a, a team called IDEC and they just broke the round the world speed record. So they just sailed around the world in 40 days um, with a full crew. And their uh, crew of, I can't remember exactly, about six guys. And their crew is not, it's and it's a trimaran that they sailed around the world in. So it's got three hulls and it goes incredible. They did it in incredible speeds. Their averages were amazing. And just to, you know, to sail around the world in 40 days is pretty mind blowing. Yeah, super mind blowing. I think. Um, but my point was that those those skippers on those boats aren't necessarily multi hull specialists. You know, they will have been brought because they've got other skills. Um, so at the moment, kind of the high end, the like record breaking end of sailing is done in multi hulls. 
even offshore. And is that just because they're more stable at high speeds or, you know, they're easier to keep upright because they're a lot wider? Um, yeah, they're and they're faster as well because you can have, they're more stable because they're wider. So you can have bigger, bigger sails up, um, basically. So, cool. so you can have more sail up, so it, then the yeah. base is more stable and you can go faster for longer. Right. And, that's that's what they that's what they do it in that's so what they specialize in yeah i guess lots of lots of events like the america's cup now is sailed in multi hulls and i don't know it's i don't know it, it's hard to say uh draw a line straight down the middle because offshore sailing has lots of different aspects mm-hmm. um and I guess really quickly define, like when you say offshore sailing, I think, you know, most people might get that, but I mean, is it literally just everything away from the, you know, like sailing across an ocean? Do you like, do you have to cross some large expanse or is it anything that is a certain distance from the coast? Um, I mean, there's no precise definition of offshore sailing, but in my mind, it would be a passage overnight that takes you out of easy reach of land you know maybe from sailing from england to france across the english channel is probably just about offshore sailing but you know if you go sail around ireland and you don't stop for a week that's that's offshore sailing um i guess probably spending spending the night at sea if you spend the night at sea then you're probably offshore offshore. yeah yeah (laughs) yeah that would be that would be my definition. But when I talk about it in terms of these trimarans and um, say the Volvo Ocean Race being a, an offshore race, I mean that they're really more. It's a, it's definitely an offshore race. You could maybe yeah. say it's an ocean race. You know, right, right, um, yeah. It's a it's, very very it's, big race. The name, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cool. So, you know, I guess, you know, you get this chance, you sail around Ireland on a Volvo 70. Um, you then subsequently are offered a job on that same boat uh, and you take that job. And and what exactly was the job? So the job was just, I was crew on the boat. So I was, um, the boat was um, run as a charter boat, which is quite unusual for a boat like of that size and performance but the skipper made it work by having a a permanent professional crew and skipper on board at all times and then we would sail with up to about 18 people on board and we had six full-time professional crew including the skipper and then so we'd get charter guests for up to 12 remaining places so my job was sailing the boat and trying to teach and help the charter guests to sail a boat and basically make sure that they were having a nice time. And were you guys doing races or were you just kind of cruising around the place? No, we were racing. Yeah. We actually, we had an absolutely crazy race schedule. We'd go, we'd race and delivery schedule. So we were all around, all around Europe. And then we raced across the Atlantic and we did loads of races in the Caribbean. So, and in a year we did a crazy amount of miles. So we'd um, do a race for example the round Britain and Ireland race is a really was a big one we did and we finished the race have a few days and then you'd be on to the next thing or we would deliver the boat to Spain from U- the UK you'd maybe have one day and then you'd have to go on to the next place and you'd arrive in for example Malta take all the stuff off all the cruising stuff or delivery stuff off the boat like your shore clothes or If you had some spare sails on board, we'd have like maybe one or two days to take all the stuff off. Then we do the race, come back in, have a nice dinner, and then the next day put all the stuff back on and then leave um, for the next place. Was it hard to keep the Was it hard to keep the boat running with that many miles and that kind of nonstop schedule? Because I know you know, like the you know they're all made of carbon fiber. They're supposed to be super light boats. They're not. long-term you know cruising boats that are kind of built heavy to withstand lots of miles over a long period of time did you guys have a lot of breakages that you had to fix or was it that you weren't you know you kind of had to hold back a little bit to keep the boat in in one piece well there's definitely a combination we especially when we're delivering for example we'd always try and deload the boat as much as we can so we really focus on keeping it together and keeping it in one piece and 
when we were racing though we you know we had some breakages you know the most common thing we'd break would be sails you know you'd you'd rip a sail right and one one thing that our skipper that I did actually I really admired our skipper for was he wouldn't hold back on the races like we were really racing every race um so that was good it wasn't you know occasionally you'd be like all right let's let's put up like take take down this big sail and put up a smaller one that's just like chill out a bit overnight or something you let right. everyone get a good night's sleep right um but uh, we gave a lot of races a very good shot like so cool uh, yeah and i'm always yeah. shocked to hear how much sales cost so i don't even like what is a what is a don't. sale for a volvo open 70 cost? you don't even want to know <laughs> <laughs> yeah a main sale is maybe in the region of a hundred thousand pounds holy cow yeah it's yeah. um it, it's like it really is i mean i suppose it's like a formula one car like those things are the edge of technology and so you know carbon fiber is not cheap and it's a whole lot of carbon fiber and those sales <laughs> yeah. are a huge amount of you know very lightweight very shaped material and when they go they you know it's a lot of material to replace yeah exactly yeah yeah and they're very um they're very specialist as well, which is that, you know, there aren't that many Volvo 70s in the world. Right. So it's not as if there's a factory churning out Volvo 70 sales. Yeah. Right. There's a guy and he makes Volvo yeah. 70 sales. Yeah. <laughs> and he probably doesn't even make them anymore. Yeah. Right. Right. He's retired. So <laughs> you have to get him out of retirement. Yeah. yeah. Deadly. So as you like finished that, uh, you know, the charter experience, how long were you out with the charter? A year? Yeah. A year. Okay. Just, yeah. Just, um, just over a year, I think. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And then, so what happened when that finished? Did that, you know, did the, did the charter move on and you just decided you'd had enough of, of that for the time or was it, you know, did it kind of shut down at the end of that season? Um, it didn't, it was kind of coming, it was coming to a close and I had, yeah, I just, um, yeah, the, basically the season was coming to a close for us and the future was a little bit unsure with the boat, what was going to happen next. The skipper was exhausted for doing from doing the circuit for two years in a row um so he knew he wanted to come back to the UK and just chill out for a bit and I thought okay well I'll do the same I'll just come back and see what happens and when I came back I thought okay well you know that was fun trying to be a professional sailor I think I'm gonna I'm gonna get an engineering nut job now and earn some money and see see what I want to do next basically and then um the offer of the job I do now came up and all of a sudden I was like, yeah, engineering, the office jobs. I don't think so. <laughs> Back to that original discussion. You just got yeah, like, exactly. the path yeah. opened up in front and you kept moving. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. So tell us about your job currently. So at the moment I am the fleet captain for a fleet of race boats that are based in cows on the Isle of Wight on the south coast of England. Um, and I got this job. The boats are owned or run by um, an academy called the Offshore Academy. And the Offshore Academy was set up a few years ago to try and promote solo sailing in Britain. So the idea was to get I talented young sailors and introduced them to solo offshore sailing, basically, with the idea being that they would find Britain's next Vendée Globe winner. And the Vendée Globe is a solo around the world race that Britain has never won. And the idea of the program was to kind of try and generate that talent and find someone who would be able to do that. Very so cool. That's the kind of that's the history of the academy that I work for. And what does a fleet captain do? Look after a fleet. <laughs> I mean, uh, like, is that, you know, are you down to like doing maintenance regularly or is it, you know, are you, I don't know, like, I don't like, I guess to me, I'm sort of looking after a fleet of boats. I kind of understand, but at the same time, it's like, what's the day to day look like? Yeah, it's, um, it is, it's changing. Like I've been doing it for over a year now. So this year will be different from last year because last year I was very new. But essentially, yeah, I'm responsible for the maintenance and the logistics for the boats. So if it's maintenance that I can do myself or that I can help the skipper of the boat to, then we'll do it ourselves. But if it's something that is beyond our our skills, then I will organize a contractor to come in and do it or 
you know, ring someone for advice on how to do it. So that's basically it's my responsibility is the maintenance and the upkeep of these boats and to make sure that they're race ready and that the skipper kind of knows knows how to look after them and is race ready as well. Cool. And so in that job, like, do you end up doing a lot of sailing as part of the job or is that, is it a totally separate thing? And, you know, you just happen to get to be around, uh, this solo sailing Academy and have a bunch of boats at your disposal. It's, it's a combination of both. Ironically, when the, when the most racing is on, like say in the, our, our, our season, there's like solo racing season around here gets really busy in, in the middle of summer. And what's when most people are kicking off their sailing, I'm probably doing the least sailing um, because I'm so busy looking after the boats. But I have had a lot, lot of opportunity to to sail and race the boats while I've been doing it um, with, a, with a view to kind of progressing on to having, having my own boat and having my own solo sailing career. So I've been, you know, done some solo sail, bringing the boats from France to England or from England to France. or um, So I've done quite a lot of, of solo sailing now myself in these boats that I look after because they have to be moved around quite a bit. And, right. Um, I've done that and then did some racing last summer in one as well. Cool. And so what's the draw with solo sailing? I mean, I, I, like I understand the draw of sailing. I, it really appeals to me. I really, really want to do more sailing at some point in my life. Um, I kind of live in the wrong place for it at the moment, but, uh, <laughs> but in any case, you know, like for you, what is, what's the special part about sailing by yourself rather than with a crew? It's kind of hard to explain. Like the first time I lit, like set off in the boat by myself, I was just so, I just, the feeling was just like, oh my God, somebody just giving me a boat to go sailing in like, oh bye I just was just couldn't wait to get out and be out at sea by myself in it I was just so happy and you really are completely in charge of everything on the boat and that's quite cool you know if, like it can very quickly be overwhelming but when it's not overwhelming it's it's really liberating it's amazing you can do whatever you want and I don't know. It's hard to it's hard to explain exactly what is so cool about it. <laughs> do you find and, it like? Do you find it? Is it like contemplative, or is it? Uh, are you just busy the whole time with you know trimming sails and kind of managing things and and keeping the boat going, or or do you you know is there a lot of time where you're just kind of sitting there with your you know with yourself and your thoughts? It's it's both, which I think is very interesting. Like it can be very meditative in a way because you could have maybe like an hour or something of frenzied activity where you have to navigate through a, you know, really rocky bit and you're just like com all the time on like on the laptop doing the navigation and like chop jumping up on deck to check that everything is lining up and the sails are still good and then popping downstairs to, you know, check the nav again and jumping up, you know, so, but when you're doing that, you're not thinking about anything else whatsoever. You're just thinking about doing that. And then when you, when things calm down a bit and you like make a cup of tea and like go up on deck and sit there a bit, you're like, Oh, cool. This is, this is really cool. <laughs> and then you have, yeah, you for sure you have time to be, to think a lot. And um, is it, you don't have very, you just have no other, um, stimulus from anything else, like no Netflix or Facebook or phone calls, unless you happen to be very close to the shore. Um, right. so yeah, it's a very um, distilled existence, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, oh, you're just keeping the boat safe, keeping the boat going fast, sleeping, eating, going to the toilet. <laughs> right, right. All the basics. <laughs> All the basics, and that's it. You know, you're not, you don't really, you don't really change your clothes. You know, you maybe put a layer on, take a layer off, but right. you tidy the boat up, but it's pretty small usually pretty tidy so right it's just you so yeah, as long as you kind of stay tidy it stays tidy exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah and does it i mean is there a a large difference in risk sailing on your own or sailing with a crew or is it you know not that much different given you know modern technology like radar and things like that i think the risk is a lot bigger yeah 
I mean, the risk of falling overboard, whether you're by yourself or with crew, I don't know, it'd be interesting to see what the difference is, but I'd, you're still in a pretty big trouble if you fall overboard either way. Um, maybe maybe even more so with crew because you're less prepared, whereas a solo sailor, you have two positioning beacons on you usually and you have... Um, the autopilot on the boat works on a remote control. So when you fall overboard, um, the a sense by the when the boat gets a certain distance away from you, a sensor is triggered on the boat right. by the remote by the remote control that you have on your around your neck or on your wrist, and the boat will tack or turn into the wind and effectively stop and wait and, yeah and wait so in that sense and, it's like way safer than it used to be in years past because i mean you know you read the stories about um you know the old uh golden globe was it yeah you know like if you fall overboard you're done you're gone like that's the end you might as well yeah. just call it a day uh because yeah the boat's not going to stop it's rigged to keep going in the same direction for ages yeah and i mean as some of the, say the guys doing the Vendée Globe at the moment, they they don't all have that same system, and be, especially with a big boat like that, like the the Open Sixty boats that are um, that go around the world, they just have a different system on which makes doing that very hard, you know. So just you just do not fall over the side, right? <laughs> and because they spend a lot of the race in the Southern Ocean where the water temperature is really, really cold. You There's, don't, you don't even if you did fall anyways. in and you did get to stop your boat and you somehow got back to your boat, the chances of you still being like able, alive enough to get on the boat are so slim. So right. you might as well just slip away. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. So there are still pretty serious So don't risks. fall in. Yeah. yeah. Don't fall in is the main rule. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anything? And then, I mean, is there anything else that's like a particular danger, like something you worry about when you're out there by yourself? Uh, hitting things, hitting things that aren't. So we have a, a a laptop for navigation, and it's got the charts of the area that we're in, and it also has kind of a this uh, positioning system called um, AIS, and AIS is um, other ships send you signals, and you send them signals, so they know who you are, where you are and what direction you're going. And, you know, that is a really excellent system because you can see all the ships in your area that have AIS. Um, and some fishing boats, for example, don't have it and might be fishing boats particularly can have a, an erratic path, you know. So if you're passing a ship, a container ship or something, usually they're going from A to B, you'd have a very good idea where they're going next. And, you can watch their lights go past, but a fishing boat might be, you know, he might be off to your left and then you come up 10 minutes later and he's off to your right and he's kind of zigzagging all over the place. And um, the kind of, those kind of hazards are probably the most scary because you really, you have to be on deck watching them. And if you're a solo sailor, like there will be times when you're not on deck, you're downstairs asleep. Right. So kind of unavoidable at a certain stage. most scary. Yeah. 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 I guess on that note, like, is there a time that stands out in your mind? Like what's the most scared you've ever been or what's the situation where you felt like you've been, uh, kind of most at risk? Um, most at risk is an interesting one. I think, I don't know. It's funny. I don't know if most at risk and most scared line up strangely. Interesting. Tell me about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I was the most frustrated when I was doing a delivery last summer so I was sailing boat from La Rochelle in France to Cowes where I am now on the Isle of Wight that's about 300 miles and um, so it was take it took about four days and I was with a I was kind of in a little bit of a convoy with um three other boats so we were sailing quite close to each other we're, um, we're a, few, a few miles from each other, but we were in radio range of each other. And we were just, we'd done like um, two days and three nights of our passage. And we were just crossing the English Channel. Actually, it was evening time. And I remember the like, conditions were brilliant. There were some big waves and with a really nice wind. And it was like getting some really good surfs down the waves. And 
um, we were like, it was going to be our last night at sea and the next, the next morning we were going to be in cows and it was sunny and, the, you know, the hard work of the summer was over and it was brilliant. <laughs> and then I had a problem with my autopilot. My autopilot basically just stopped working completely. And all of my instruments and the boat giving the wind data and speed data and stuff stopped working. And um, so I couldn't leave the tiller. I couldn't leave the, the steering. I had to keep steering. And unfortunately, those the waves that had made the sailing so much fun um, meant that it was really hard for me to, because usually, if you can imagine kind of steering, tying your steering wheel off, you can kind of do that. You can kind of tie it so it doesn't move. But the wind direction and the wave direction were just such a combination that I couldn't really do that for very long. So I'd have to like run downstairs, try and fiddle with the electronics for maybe 10 seconds and then run back upstairs and put the boat back in its right course. Um, so that was a little bit stressful. And because I wasn't in a race, I was just doing a delivery. I thought, well, I'll, I'll turn my engine on and my engine would help kind of hold me into the wind um, for long enough for me to just go downstairs and um, have a proper investigate of the electronics and what's happening. So I went to turn the engine on and I turned it on. And um, it's quite hard when you, it's quite noisy, obviously, at sea with the wind going past. So I turned the engine on, put it into forward gear and um, kind of like waited for it to take effect and I couldn't feel anything. So, okay, I put a few more revs on, still couldn't feel anything. And I was like, that's really weird. And I like just put, leaned in into the side of the boat to listen to the engine and it was revving really high so I had loads of power going to it and next thing basically the propeller got enough grip and we were in reverse so basically what had happened oh, my God. engine my gears had got stuck in reverse so I was in I was the way I was lined up in with the waves was a really I was at a really bad angle to a wave. So I basically ended up reversing off quite a big wave really hard and then slamming into the next wave behind me with my stir in the back of the boat first. Right. And square to the water. Yeah, exactly. Like whack. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the two rudders on the boat, the rudders are what you use to steer the boat. There's two rudders and one of them flipped completely around and inverted. So one was at 180 degree angle to the other one. So now I couldn't steer at all because they were locked like that. So I was uncontrollably in reverse, had no autopilot and couldn't steer. And <laughs> I was like, oh, this is shit. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get at like what? I mean, I guess what goes through your mind at that stage? Like, were you at all panicking or was it literally just a, oh, this is a really annoying situation? At first, the first time... Um, so the autopilot going, I was like, oh, this is a nice little challenge for the evening now, you know? And I was like, not that worried because, okay, I was, I was knackered. Like I was really tired, but because I knew I was going to be home the night before the night next day and there was other boats around me, I was like, it's fine. I can just steer by hand the whole way there. It'll be grand. I'll be wrecked when I get there, but it's no big deal. And then the engine problem and, you know, it's obviously at by that time, I didn't know what was wrong with the engine because I hadn't been downstairs to look at it. So all I knew was the result of what had happened. Um, so I was I was a bit panicked because it was just the rudder flipping around was the scariest bit because that had never happened to me before and I'd never heard of any it happening to anybody. So I was a bit worried that I wouldn't be able to solve that problem. Uh, whereas the other problems, you know, I could just turn everything off and just sail the boat like... God right. intended. Um, right. But, um, so I radioed the other guys and I think I was just working on the problem and it was only when I picked up the radio to radio the guys to say, Hey guys, I've got a bit of a problem here. Can you just like slow down and, um, you know, or maybe come back towards my position and just like hang around till I sort it out. And when I picked up the radio, I couldn't speak. I was really like completely had no breath to speak at all and that's when I realized like oh I think I'm you know having a minor situation here yeah and and what did you do in the end I mean was it was it something that was fairly straightforward to fix or did it require you know the rest of the you know group coming back and, and helping you sort it out well it was like once I kind of talked to them and I 
like settled a little bit. And I think I just basically was out of breath as well because I'd literally been running around for 20 minutes and not sat down. And I just, I just commit the, because I'd been running around so much to try and keep the boat steady because the, uh, the boom, which is the, um, like basically large bit of metal that supports the bottom of the sail. Um, as the boat was spinning around uncontrollably, that was kind of whacking across the boat the whole time. Yeah, which wasn't try, very trying relaxing. to kill you basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Giant and, metal baseball bat swinging around the place. Yeah. So I, I was just like, right, I'm just going to take that sail down and like tie it down for a minute, and then I'm just going to sit down and chill out. And we're just going to go around in circles because I have no rudder and there's nothing I can do. Um, there's nothing I can do about that right now. So I just went upstairs, took down all the sails, then went downstairs, just sat there for a second, and was like, okay, I'll make a plan of action. And I had a look at the engine and realized that just a cable had had broken. So I was like, okay, fine. I've got no no engine. That's okay. Um, I don't need it. Had a look at the electronics. Couldn't see anything obviously wrong. I was like, okay, I don't need them. But I really need this rudder to be fixed. So I just was like, okay, well, I, I just have to go back to where the rudder is and I have to fix it. <laughs> so I went back and... I basically just see, I could see where the rudder had inverted, where the problem was. And I just had to pull it really, really hard, just pull it really hard, put it back where it was, lashed it where it was meant to be. And then I was like, okay, fine, let's go. <laughs> um, but in, in the end, the guys came alongside and um, they were all sailing with two people on their boats. Um, and I was just me on my boat. So they swapped one of their guys onto my boat with me to help me um come in that night and that was probably the hardest bit actually because I was really really determined to do the whole sail by myself I was you know it was going to be my longest solo sail and we just had a really really tough month of work and to do, to complete it after having that month of work I would just be like yeah okay cool I can I can do anything that was you know that was a good test so even though it was only a few hours, I was pretty gutted that somebody else got on the boat with me. Um, I mean, it was totally, it was completely the right call for the guys to do in terms of that's the reason we bought extra people on the other boats so that if we had a problem, we could swap around. Um, right. But that was, that was definitely the hardest bit of that. It for was me. a hard, hard pill to swallow. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Do you think, I mean, it's like boats are complex machines. There's a lot of moving parts. Like, do you think, uh, you know, some like are the people that end up being the best sailors and and maybe the best solo sailors, the ones that just naturally can stay calm and in strange situations like that and work through problems the way you were just describing, you know, thinking, okay, the engine, I've checked that. I don't need it. Fine. The electronics, I've checked those. I can't fix them. Don't need them. Fine. The thing that I really need is this thing over here and I need to figure out how to fix it. And then, you know, you do figure out how to fix it. Is, the, is there some correlation with sailors being sort of good at, you know, rigging temporary solutions to things and, you know, how good their sailing careers overall are? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say definitely for the solo, solo sailor. Yeah, you have to be pretty resourceful. And those guys, you know, the guys who are, some guys are still doing the Vendée Globe race that left in November, this like solo around the world race. And yeah, they they will have tried to think through every single scenario on the boat before they've left to figure out, do I have the materials to do this, to, to fix this problem? And yeah, I think it is a, it is a very important skill to be able to do that. And moreover, to keep calm, like you said, you know, that's, that's really important. Like this, your, your mental state when you're solo sailing is like, you have to be absolutely rock solid. You have to be calm because there's going to be big highs. You know, you're doing well in a race. You've had a good day. You've got good speeds and there's going to be big lows. Like something is broken. You're doing badly in a race. Maybe the boat's got bad damage. You're in a bad situation, but you, the most important thing is being able to control those highs and lows. And basically you end up with a kind of median mental state <laughs> of kind of okay all the time. And is that something, you know, like you were saying earlier on, you're, you know, you're kind of working towards your own solo sailing campaign. Is that something you sort of uh, like, is there a way to train yourself on that or is it just miles in the boat? I think, I think you can, you can train yourself. Um, 
there's nothing like miles in the boat. You know, I think you can be you can be conscious of that. I think, and I I try to be kind of self aware. You know, even in the you know if I have if I get frustrated with a boat that I'm just working on just at the dock, and I kind of think, okay, well what what would I do if I was at sea and this happened? You know, I couldn't get this frustrated. I'd have to I'd have to be a lot more rational about how I'm dealing with this. You know, so I think you can I just try to have a little awareness of that in the back of my mind. And but yeah, there's nothing like miles on the boat really to Right. To force you to get better at it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I suppose the, uh, you know, the risk reward trade off there is maybe a little bit easier to swallow when you're uh, on shore trying to deal with a problem than it is, you know, in exactly. the middle of the Atlantic in the middle exactly. of a storm. Yeah, yeah. And because, you know, when the boat's at the dock, you can just throw your spanner like across the boat and go for a coffee if you really have to. Right. But it, when that choice is completely eliminated, you know, and that's like the only experience I've had of, well, one of the most vivid experiences you know that situation I just described and I remember thinking right well I just this is you know you don't have another option it's not like you can't just go for a coffee you just like I I just have to fix this problem there's no choice it's not about what how good an engineer I am or how ingenious I am it's just there's that's the only option and that so you find a way of fixing it do you think in one sense that actually helps like is having that um really strict constraint of, I don't really have another choice. Uh, is that something that is a focusing factor, uh, you find? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very focusing. And I, that's probably interesting because you learn, it makes you learn, you learn a lot about yourself, you know, that you can, you can deal with it. You know, something you would have thought maybe was insurmountable and you're, if you're not given the choice, you're like, Oh, I can do that. And right. it makes you think, Whoa, well, why can't I just do that all the time then? <laughs> right, right. Very cool. So I guess let's come back to that solo uh, sailing campaign. What, I mean, I guess, first off, what is a solo sailing campaign? Is this, um, you know, are you, is there a specific set of races? Is it uh, all sorts of different races worldwide? Is it, you know, what is it exactly? It's hard to define exactly, but I'll give you my take on it. And my take on it would be that you, uh, like a, a campaign means a kind of a sponsored or financially supported sailing career. And in my mind, that would be my immediate big goal, immediate, would be to do the Vendée Globe in 2020. and. Leading up to that, there are definitely a series of races that I would like to do in order to be ready to do the Vendée Globe. So it's it's obviously a different thing for everybody, but my idea would be to start find a sponsor who is interested in doing the Vendée Globe and who is interested in sponsoring a boat to do the Vendée Globe. And then as, as part of that, Vendée Globe race we kind of start a partnership where they will support me as I'm preparing for the race you know right. in buying the boat and then using the boat to do some qualifying races and preparation races um and then on a on a more local scale you know the boats that I look after you know they're they're solo sailing boats so I will we'll try and sail them as much as I can and get experience in them and where the town I live in on the Isle of Wight is really good for sailing. So, you know, I'll try and learn from the people around me. So you're sort of in the right about, place for it at the right time. Uh, it's just a, you know, it's a matter of, I guess, and you opened up a can of worms there, like wanting to do the Vendée Globe and, uh, I guess a little over three years or almost four years is a, uh, is a not small achievement. I mean, around the world, nonstop by yourself. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, you know, you asked, do you have any audacious goals? Well, there you go. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's it's interesting because where I, because I hang out with a lot of solo offshore sailors because of my work and because of my interests, it feels like everybody I know wants to do the Vontae Globe. But actually, I think it's quite a small 
percentage of the population who would like to do it. And yeah, I mean, what is the what is the you know the winning time? What is the average time of of you know of the com- you know a completed Von Dijk globe? Like, but the winner of the last race just did it in seventy days. Wow, um, a, li- a little over two months, basically. Yeah, yeah. Let me just. I want to just double check his um his time because he yeah it was amazing. It was he took. They took quite a lot of time off the off the previous winner's record. Um, oh, sorry, excuse me. He did it in seventy four days. Still, but the guy before had done it in seventy eight or seventy nine. Um, but seventy four days. And is that the world. and is that race? Um, I, I mean, I guess I'm. You know, I'm thinking of uh, a couple of sailing documentaries that I've seen in the past, and that race follows. I mean, it leaves. It starts and finishes in England. Is that right? It starts and finishes in France, actually, in France. yeah, okay. in um, kind of northwestern France, okay. in um, Les Sables, which is in the region of Vendée. Okay, hence the name. Hence yeah. the name. Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. And so it's it's really just uh, go south, turn left, go around a couple of capes, and turn left again and come north. Yeah, yeah. Only they they turn right. They go south, and then they go um, they go down South America. Oh, um, what? They go around the other way. No, they don't. They turn left. You're right. And then they turn left again. (laughs) I was trying to really. I should really check this. You should check this. Yeah, probably. It'd be good to know. They turn. (laughs) Sorry. They go. They go down beside Brazil. That's why I was trying to say. Got it. Got it. Um, Got it. They go. They don't go down like as me or you would go if we're driving a car to the Cape, like down to right. South Africa. Right, right. They wouldn't um, go down the, the western side they, of Africa. Yeah. They go, and, and this is where the map is really confusing, I think, uh, because you think exactly. of Brazil being way over there, way far exactly. east, but actually it's almost straight down from, uh, from England. Yeah. So they go down to South America, and then they turn left, and then they go across through the Southern Ocean, basically do a lap of Antarctica, the, yeah, and then and left again. Yeah, back up was the- it? I think Sir Robin Knox uh, said, "Oh, it's very, you know, his his like line was, it's it's really actually quite easy to sail around the world. You just go south until you can't go any further, turn left, go around the bottom, and then turn left again and go north until you smell fish and chips, and you're done." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, that's um, that's pretty much it, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> easy peasy. Uh, so, I mean, I guess like what, what's the draw there? Like, is it just that it's a, an ultra fame, you know, the Vondi globe, that it's an ultra famous, it's like, it's sort of the, it's the Mount Everest of solo sailing is that's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. It's just the, the ultimate, um, yeah, it's the ultimate in solo offshore sailing really. I mean, and it's, it's funny because you, as a sailor, you kind of think, oh, the Vendée Globe, like, that's a really good race to do. That's really cool. And then actually take somebody else to be like, wow, sailing solo around the world, that's cool. And you're like, oh, yeah, I suppose it is. You know, just in terms of human endeavor, it's also a really cool thing to do. Yeah, know? yeah. I, I mean, I would say so. And and even if you're miles off the winning time, like, still to go around the entire planet in, you know, some number of months is by, you know, wind power is a pretty incredible thing it is it is and i think you know if it's um yeah like you said it's my my goal for my for my first fond globe anyway would be to to just get around to just experience the race and then you know depending on how that went maybe in later years i'd come back with a really big sponsor and um try and win the race but it's, you know, I feel at the moment you've got to take it, you've got to have a realistic approach as well. It's expensive, you know, and the guy who's won the race is, they've spent millions and millions of, of euros on his campaign, millions. Yeah. I mean. And over years and years, and he's come, come second in two Vendée Globes and this year he finally won. So I'd, his, they have spent so much money on his campaign. Um, so I think, you know, if, if you come from a country that's not France, basically, you have to, you know, you have to kind of warm people up to the idea of the race and you kind of are forging a bit of a path in terms of finding a sponsor and finding some 
recognition for the race. Right, right. Because it's, um, like you said, uh, and actually, I feel silly that I forgot that it was French because I remember, you know, Vendée is like, it's a newspaper or something that sponsors the race, isn't it? Yeah, well, Vendée is the name of the region, actually, that, ah, it's, okay. that it's in. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, so okay. Vendée is is the name of the region that the it starts from. And then the region's yeah. newspaper or something has a pretty similar name or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, but that's, so that's obviously it's, it's a big French thing. You know, it's like the tour yeah. de France, like they, exactly. they want to win. It's a really big deal to them. And so they're going to be happy to pour yeah. money into their own, you know, their own exactly. sailors. Yeah. yeah. And because it gets, it gets bigger coverage than the tour de France in France. <clears throat> wow. Like it is, it's a really big deal. And so in that, in that regard, for French sponsors, it makes sense because they're going to get good return on their investment. They're going to get people, their brand will be there on TV right, at the right. start. And every time that their skipper is mentioned, their brand will be mentioned. Yeah. And so, plastered down the side of the boat, basically. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yep, yep. And all you know, there'll be a helicopter shot of their boat like flying out of the start line. And, you know, yeah. there'll be media reports on the different skippers and they'll be naming the boats and the boat will be named after their brand. So in France, it's it's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's big news. Lots of people follow it. Lots. You know, the whole country gets um, you know, understands and gets behind it. So it's, it's really cool. It's really cool for a sailor to, to see that, to see the whole country getting, getting into, into something that here is quite a niche thing to be into. Yeah. I mean, is like, I feel like that's been a, that's kind of a common theme because, you know, many of the, I guess, is that a historic thing? Like are the French just, have they always been really into solo sailing or just sailing in general? Uh, or is there, you know, is that something that's, more modern that they you know that they've sort of come to dominate i know they've they've always been there and since the you know the there's been a lot of like a lot of very famous british names of course like francis chichester and um robin ox johnson and ella MacArthur, like lots of british sailors who've made a really big impact on on offshore sailing like global records you know the first person to sail around the world, the first person to sail around solo, the first person to race around, you know. Um, but the France really got a, a grip on it. And like I said, a English, British person or anybody who's not French has never won the Vendée Globe. So I think that kind of tells you what. Yeah. And the, all the, the round the world crude record, the round the world solo record, they're all held by French people. There's um, a there's a certain amount of pride tied up in there, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but like I said, it's a it's a kind of self fulfilling prophecy as well because if you're in a country where there's a really big following, people will find a sponsor will find the sponsors for those kind of right of uh, course projects. Yeah, of course. So, Much easier to find money when it's well understood. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Cool. Well, I hope I, I wish you all the best luck. Uh, it's a Thank crazy you. goal. Uh, I think it's, it's like definitely, um, it's inspiring for sure. You know, I think of things like, uh, you know, El Cap or, you know, climbing projects and things like that. And then you kind of put sailing by yourself, uh, around through the Southern ocean for months on end. And it really does like kind of put a lot of those things in perspective. Um, suffering for a few days on the side of a mountain is one thing. Suffering for <laughs> months on end in a boat by yourself with no one else there is a different thing. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I might hate it, but uh, <laughs> I don't think I will. But you won't find out until you're there, so. Exactly. A little bit too late. Yep. Yeah. yep. yep. No, I'm, cool, so, I'm pretty confident I won't yeah. hate it. Well, I hope not. I hope not. So I guess I'll, um, I think it's probably time to nearly wrap up, but there's a few questions that, uh, are a bit more generic, uh, that I've, I've been aiming to ask people. And obviously this is episode number two, so I've not really gotten a chance to ask them to anybody yet. So you'll be the first person that gets to answer these. Cool. So the very first one, um, is pretty simple. How do you define adventure? This is an interesting one, actually. I had to talk, I had to think about it quite a lot. And I think 
for me, adventure is going off into something that's unknown and that you suspect might bring you to the ends of or the edge of your endeavor, the edge of what you're capable of and maybe push you further. But that's, I think, what um, what adventure is to me. And something so that's It's not only that you don't know what the outcome is going to be, but it also you are sort of going into it suspecting that it's going to push you close to your edge. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I, I would think for me, like a, a real adventure is something that, yeah, you're going into knowing, knowing that you're going to find something out about yourself by, I, I don't know, stretching your own capabilities. And is that, I mean, would you call that the most important part? I mean, the next question uh, on the list here is why is adventure important to you? And is, is that a really kind of the essence of it? It's about kind of learning new stuff about yourself or is there something more to it? Well, having fun, um, <laughs> you know, having a good time. And I, I think that often, you know, maybe it's one of those things that when you're finding stuff out about yourself, you know, you could be having a lot of fun or you could be having a really bad time. <laughs> um, but I think, I think, yeah, the kind of feeling that you're going to be pushed a bit or you're going to be learn something new about yourself for me would be an important aspect of adventure. Yeah. I wouldn't, I think something that's known or something that you know you can achieve it wouldn't be that adventurous for me. Cool. And do you feel like, um, you know, you've obviously, like we talked earlier about, you know, kind of seeing the path laid out in front of you on one side and then seeing the the deep dark forest on the other side and, and, you know, heading towards the woods. But is there, do you feel like there's a lot of things you've had to sacrifice or certain aspects of your life you've had to sacrifice in order to, to head towards that, you know, path less followed? Um, well, just, kind of, you know, kind of like I mentioned before, I had a, a life all laid out and set up and, um, I guess, yeah, I did, I did sacrifice that to, to try this life, you know, to try and be a professional sailor. And I suppose the life I've chosen now, you know, I kind of live far away from my family and I'm really immersed in my work and that is all towards this end goal of, of you know, being a solo sailor and achieving my ambitions. So yeah, I guess there is, there is quite a lot of sacrifice, but I almost, I almost feel like, um, making those sacrifice kind of drives you harder a little bit because you, you kind of, you're going from what you've given up almost. This has to be worth what you gave up. Um, you know, each, each sacrifice is a little bit of kind of, you know, debit and you have to work hard to credit it back <laughs> in another way. If that's that makes a, that's sense. an interesting way of thinking about it. I've never, I've never thought about it that way, but I think it, it makes sense. It kind of resonates. Um, yeah. cool. Well, thank you, Joan. Uh, it's been super fun talking. Uh, I realize I've, uh, probably kept you up pretty late this no evening, no but... no it's fine it's been brilliant yeah i'm sorry i cursed in the middle of it i think that's allowed uh i don't know if there's <laughs> there's no uh there's no i think if you listen to the first podcast i curse quite a lot with my brother and i was told <laughs> by a few people that i should probably not do that as much namely my mother but <laughs> sweet yeah cool. well i only good. i only did one so yeah that's good. we got away we got away well this time yeah cool all right well listen it's been great, great. talking and yeah. uh we shall talk again soon Hey everyone, Jeff here again. I just wanted to say thank you again for listening to another episode of the Lives of Adventure podcast. This week's uh, guest, Joan Malloy, is a good friend of mine, and I've known her for quite a while, but actually this is the first time I've heard many of the stories that we heard today on the podcast, so it was uh, a great conversation, and uh, thanks again to Joan for joining me. 
Uh, if anybody is interested, this show and all of our past shows, our one past show, is up online at livesofadventure.com where you can find all the episodes and show notes with timestamps on them so you can get exactly to the point that you want to listen to and uh, dig into some more of the details about some of the boats we talked about and some of the races and that sort of thing. So again, thank you very much and I'm looking forward to talking to you guys again soon in the future. Take care. Bye-bye.